Welcome to another episode of Financially Well, the finance podcast for millennials. I want to share a detail about my own money management today. I don't use any fintech apps to invest. Now, if you're currently thinking about where to invest, I want to discuss a common decision point for many millennials, whether to use robo-advisors, often with fintech apps included, or stick with a more traditional approach. And I'll frame the debate as Betterment versus Vanguard, or in other words, the longest standing independent robo-advisor against the longtime leader in low-cost investing. When I want to invest, I open my laptop and log on to Vanguard, with whom I invest almost all my family's money. The primary reason is that Vanguard, through its late founder, Jack Bogle, pioneered the low-cost index fund. Essentially, Vanguard created access for you and me to diverse, inexpensive investment options. In addition, Investopedia writes, Vanguard has a fairly unique structure in terms of investment management companies. The company is owned by its funds. The company's different funds are then owned by the shareholders. Thus, the shareholders, like me and perhaps you, are the true owners of Vanguard. The company has no outside investors other than its shareholders. Most of the major investment firms are publicly traded. So I've appreciated over the years that Vanguard's incentives align with mine at least slightly more than my alternative options. So should you invest your money with Vanguard then? You certainly could do far worse for yourself and your money, but Vanguard isn't perfect. And that reality becomes more important to consider as companies like Betterment increasingly offer robo-advisor services and slick fintech apps, right? Now, in May, Dr. James M. Dahl, who founded the White Coat Investor blog, asked in a post whether Vanguard had lost its way. And he highlighted four issues that Vanguard critics point to as indication that maybe Vanguard has regressed since it first became popular. Number one, Vanguard also offers actively managed mutual funds. Two, the company is no longer the low-cost leader. Three, Vanguard has a reputation for poor customer service. And four, they've expanded to offer financial advice. Dahl then explains why, for the most part, none of these arguments should cause investors like us much concern. First, he says Vanguard has always offered a selection of more expensive, actively managed mutual funds alongside its low-cost index funds. Two, the fact that competitors such as Fidelity and Charles Schwab now offer low-cost index funds doesn't reflect poorly on Vanguard. Rather, as he says, it means it forced the industry to change. This is what winning looks like. Imitation is the most sincere form of flattery. Three, as Dahl notes, Vanguard apparently used to pick up within three rings when you called. Now, as Vanguard has grown due to its popularity, you might be on hold literally for hours. But if strong customer service is important to you, you now can buy Vanguard funds at other brokerages too, including Fidelity and Schwab. Dahl's only complaint about Vanguard's advisory service structure, to touch on that fourth point, is that you simply cannot provide high quality, personalized financial planning and investment management for 0.3% of a $100,000 portfolio. People have way too high expectations of what they should get for their $300 a year. This is a product for the masses designed to compete with the robo-advisors, not a serious contender for a real financial advisor. And this last point ties in well with how you might think about where you invest your money. As Vanguard's relatively new offering indicates, even the largest investment platforms now try to pitch some form of robo-advisor service. But when should you embrace an automated investment service, particularly on mobile fintech apps? Let's start with a definition and a quick overview. As CNBC wrote last year, robo-advisors, quote, aren't actually tangible robots. They're algorithm co companies have developed to automate digital investing. Plug some details, such as age, savings goals, risk comfort, into a computer or phone app, and the algorithm assembles and manages a personalized investment portfolio just for you. They include independent shops like Betterment, Personal Capital, and Wealthfront. 
although Wealthfront recently was acquired by UBS. Traditional Wall Street brokerages like Fidelity Investments, Merrill Lynch, and Morgan Stanley, and those like fin financial engines that cater to 401k plan investors. So ultimately, Business Insider, in a similar article, concluded a robo-advisor is really more of an investment tool than a resource. But I want to stress that overall, fintech apps that provide investment services have benefited millions of people. Simply put, they've made the stock market more accessible. They typically offer a lower barrier to entry to investors. So people who want to grow their wealth but have felt intimidated by or shut out of the stock market now may feel more confident and welcome. Their slick modern interfaces appeal to investment novices more than most traditional investment websites. And they're often easier to navigate. So when you need to make a decision about where to invest, Betterment versus Vanguard, for example, how should you choose? RoboAdvisors can be a strong option for three groups of people in particular. First, young adults who have never invested before. Second, people who have no interest in learning about or paying much attention to their investments. And three, those who have no intention to ever work with a human financial planner. The benefits for people who fall into these categories revolve around the investment portfolios that most robo-advisors offer. The fintech apps that include robo-advisor services often first ask you to answer a few questions about your investment goals and risk tolerance. Then if you select their recommended portfolio, you're likely investing in low-cost diversified index funds. In fact, as you compare different robo-advisors, investment performance isn't much at stake since many of their offerings are so similar. And if you've never invested before, this can be a great starting point. If you have no interest in managing your own investments, the robo-advisor essentially can take on that burden for you. And finally, if you don't intend on putting together a financial plan for your life, a robo-advisor can help to make sure you're not making major investment mistakes. Even so, you shouldn't view any fintech apps as benevolent forces that always have your best financial interests in mind. You don't want to blindly trust a robo-advisor with your money, even if you appreciate their technology and marketing that seems targeted directly at you. Here are a few situations which CNBC detailed in their um, article in which you might want to start being being a bit more cautious about the robo-advisor service you sign up for because of the unnecessary investment costs you might be incurring. First, the typical robo-advisor charges you 0.25 to 0.35% annually for their advice service. So this isn't necessarily free. Second, some robo-advisors invest clients in their name brand funds, which boost the company's revenue via fund fees. And finally, they may also levy higher account minimums or fees for different tiered service levels. Now, higher investment expenses aren't your only risk with some fintech apps. Many young investors, for example, previously fell prey to Robinhood's gamification of investing. As UC Berkeley's Kathleen Pender described in early 2021, the Robinhood app makes investing fun and, critics say, addictive. New members get a free share of stock after they scratch off the image of a lottery ticket, and when they reach certain milestones, digital confetti rains down on their screen. Fintech apps that present investing as a game can lead some investors to make incredibly risky decisions that they don't fully understand. In addition to certain complex investment strategies that some platforms offer, a robo-advisor also can't sufficiently address the emotional and psychological elements of investing. A critical question such as, what scares you about putting your savings in the stock market, doesn't factor into a fintech app's one-click investment option. And then most recently, the Wall Street Journal's um, Jason Zweig reported on the vague and potentially misleading promises that certain fintech apps make in their marketing materials. He wrote specifically about companies that promise savings accounts with higher interest rates. He wrote, before you grab what sounds like a tempting yield, make sure you take a closer look. Fintech companies aren't always banks and don't always have to follow the same rules banks do. 
their disclosures and marketing can make high yields sound like more of a cinch than they are. At most of them, though, you must maintain specific account sizes, hit spending targets, or do business with affiliated companies. Don't get me wrong. The easy, slick interfaces that robo-advisors offer appeal to me, too. And I'm just as vulnerable to clever marketing as anyone else. But ultimately, I don't want to spend any more time than necessary in my investment accounts. Rather, I want to think through my investment strategy in advance. I want to set up frequent, automatic contributions into as many of my different investment accounts as possible. And when I unexpectedly have extra savings to invest, I want to already have a plan for where exactly that money will go. So I don't ever really want or need fintech apps on my phone, particularly for robo-advisor services. When I hear a robo-advisor representative, in this case, Wealthfront spokeswoman Ellie Stolnitz, say, quote, our users want to be able to manage money the same way they manage other things, like online food delivery via DoorDash. I immediately recognize a disconnect with my own investment approach and goals. The takeout food business is not the model on which I want to base my approach to building wealth. So for the indefinite future, I'll stick with Vanguard, and I'll gladly accept their low costs in exchange for relatively mediocre technology. Thanks for listening to the Financially Well podcast. And if you like this episode, I'd be honored for you to share a link with your friends and colleagues. Take care.